Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I'm your host, Ashley Russo, president and executive producer of The Peak TV. For our podcast, we decided to explore the people behind the narratives. I'll introduce decision makers and influencers who are winners in their field and find out the intimate story behind their rise to success. I wanted to invite everybody. I'm so excited to have you here for Unscripted. Thank you so much for listening. What a fabulous guest we have here today. I am welcoming Sadie Nardini, who I was lucky enough to meet at the Lehigh Valley Women's Summit back in June. And she was gracious enough to chat with us all the way from California. So Mason, so Sadie, welcome to Unscripted with Russo. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you again after you rocked that whole MC situation at the summit and hi from sunny California. Although it looks like we're not as hot here as you guys are right now. It is, it is so hot here. We are definitely having a, a very big summer heat wave. We're expecting thunderstorms tonight, but that's okay. It's to be expected. Humidity, East Coast, what can you do? Exactly. So we want to learn a little bit more about you. You have such an interesting story. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and well, let's start with what, what do you do now? So people have some frame of reference of the awesomeness that is Sadie Nardini, because we got to experience it at the women's summit and, um, it just was so empowering. Um, but tell people a little bit about yourself now, and then I want to dive backwards a little bit and get into your story. Sure. So right now I live in Santa Barbara, California. I have a home studio in which I record a lot of stuff, but yoga flows mostly, yoga shreds, which are hit plus yoga, but all joint safer for mostly women over 40, like myself. Like myself. Yeah, so we can continue to grow and get really strong and fit, but also mindful of our bodies as they are changing a little bit and need some more love and care. Uh, We do that, I have an online yoga studio and yoga shred studio called the Fit and Fierce Club. And I make these a la carte online courses for not only just, you know, people at home to do things like get fit and fierce in 30 days. <laughs> uh, well, who doesn't want that? I mean, it's amazing. And I, I love the idea because I'm 43 and I have to say, having been someone who's always uh, tried to be, you know, fit and active and tried all different types of workouts. And I'm someone who kind of finds something fun about whatever I'm doing. Um, but I do see a serious shift after 40 and I don't have that same desire to kind of, I guess, almost abuse my body through a workout the the way I used to. Um, But you kind of came to this in a unique way. Um, You know, you had, you had an accident, I guess is is what happened um, that changed your entire approach. So tell me a little bit about that. What happened? Well, yeah, this was a massive shift in where I was going, even even young at 13. You know, I was very active and loved just running around and doing whatever, totally free moving. And then one day I went swimming. I was in the shallow end of the pool and a big grown man didn't see me there, I guess, and cannonballed right so on top scary. of my head. <laughs> he cannonballed on my head and, and uh, I got a severe spinal injury because of that, which rendered me partially paralyzed for a couple of years. I had a really hard time moving, breathing. I could mostly crawl. It was hard for me to walk. And I was just having constant panic attacks because my breathing diaphragm wasn't working properly and my system was all out of whack. And they did not know what to do for me because I didn't remember the accident. By the time two weeks later, obviously something was really wrong. My mom took me to the hospital uh, they, I didn't know enough to tell them, oh, I'd had this accident. I forgot about it. It just blanked out. They tested me and said I had probably had spinal meningitis. Um, that was now healed. They didn't know. Then they tested me and found I had stage four leukemia. And for two weeks, we thought I had stage four leukemia until they said it was a lab error. Which so- is probably one of the scariest things I can't even imagine going through thinking that this is what, I mean, what else could go wrong? Yes. I guess it's good news to find it's a lab error, but nobody wants to go through that. Oh, I mean, they said, well, that's why you feel so terrible. And I was just terrified for two weeks. So was my mom, obviously. And they're rerunning all the stuff. So anyway, I, they didn't know what to do for me after all that. They said, well, I guess, you know, just go home, whatever you had melted your central nervous system. And now you've got to just 
try to deal and maybe get a wheelchair and maybe you'll walk again and maybe you won't. And so it wasn't really a very positive prognosis. I mean, and you're 13 at this time. Yes. 13. So I mean, to 15, I was out, I was down for the count. I mean, from a completely active lifestyle, popular at school, you know, loving my life and all of that to complete and utter just disability that took me about 10 years to fight out from in ways that I can't still believe I was that stubborn to do it, especially at that young age. My mom didn't know what to do. So she had these yoga books and she said, why don't I stick you in some restorative poses and we can breathe. And I did that for hours, you know, hours and hours and hours. And that's all I could do. So all the stuff I do now are fit and fierce over 40 and woohoo and, you know, mindful, but, but stronger exercise. That was not even in my near future, much less who knew about my far future. You were just trying to get back to what would be considered almost normal living. Yes. Right. I mean, that, that now this was a battle for your health and for, you know, stability and I guess normalcy and the life you had known and have really wasn't what you have now was a fight for your life in a lot of ways. It absolutely was. And I remember being in this dark room in this apartment because of the stimulation of light and sound would really trigger a bunch of stuff in my body that nobody understood. And I was just inside in the dark. And I thought at 15, I thought I could just end this if it doesn't start getting better. You know, I always have that. That's how bad it was. I said, I will always have that if, but let's see what I am capable of. Let me fight first. And then if nothing works, I can't live like this. I won't. And when you know clients and students and and professionals come to me and say they've got this or that going on and and their health is maybe not where they would want it to be or their relationships or the stress i know what they feel like and i haven't been through everything but i've been through a lot and i think that helps now in the way that i'm able to communicate transformation to people whether it's physical or professional or or whatever it is I can put myself in a broad spectrum of experience and say, look, even if you can't do this huge thing, maybe it's a squad or maybe it's a whole online course, you can chip away and do something. And I improved myself little by little. You know, each breath I took was getting easier. I was having five panic attacks a day instead of, you know, 10. And that to me was progress. So I counted my progress in these tiny little increments, but I saw change. And if I could see change, I saw hope. And that's where I am today, where I'm a culmination of all of those moments of chipping away and moving toward hope and toward health and away from the darkness. It's such an amazing story. Take me back a little bit and tell me what, what were you like as a kid? If you were to describe yourself as a five or six year old little girl, what were you like? What was your personality? What kind of things were you into? Uh, I would say the best word for me would be precocious. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little wild child. You know, my mom took me to the doctor once and he to- he said, oh, she's got ADHD, whichever one is the kid one, ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder. She's hyper <laughs> hyperactive. So medicate her. And my mother took me home and gave me one of the pills and I slept for two straight days. And when I woke up, my, my spark was gone. She said, yeah, just really kind of dulled you out. And the thing that made you, you and was unique yes. was missing. Yeah. And thank God. She took me to the next doctor and he said, she's not hyperactive. She's hyper creative and you need to give her a lot of outlets for that creativity. And that's what my mom did. She, she helped me create worlds outside and gave me projects to do and took me to classes that were way beyond my school years. And I love that stuff and art, you know, art classes. And to this day, if I am in a day where I don't have something to create or envision or write about, I feel a little bit empty and, you know, I like to relax with the best of them, but then I just start tapping my fingers and like, let me get my Moleskine. Let me get my journal out. Let's, let's write a song. Let's, let's write on a course. So you know? just creative and artistic and fun. And you, I mean, you have such a larger than life personality and you can tell you have so much, um, not only love to share, but I think you really want to tap into that in other people. And it's cool to experience live. And that's, that's the piece I think that really gets people immediately. 
um, is just when they meet you to see that. So tell me a little bit about how this morphed into um, what you're doing now and how did you kind of find this voice? That is a great question. Um, you know, I, th I think I'm still finding it like we all are. I did grow up having a lot of energy and very comfortable in front of people, which isn't a usual skill. I loved talking in front of groups and singing and doing the stuff. Um, so as I started moving through my career, I was at first teaching like everybody else. I started as a yoga teacher and I was just teaching like every popular teacher you can imagine. So I was trying to be more like them. So I was a mimic for a while and then realized I was getting really frustrated, not, ha not sharing my own voice. And it took another few years to really let myself out. So for a very precocious out, outward lioness type of person, I still had to go through this vulnerable process of fear busting and all the stuff I talk about. I had to do it too, because th there's nothing scarier, I think, than being yourself in front of people and then risking. It's really the hardest thing in a lot of ways. And I think people don't realize that that authenticity is something everyone needs to find. And it doesn't really matter what your job is, right? And what, what your calling is in life. That authenticity is something everyone needs. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your mom, because you talked about her in a couple instances, and I can tell that she's a real rock for you. And not only in, in the encouragement of you as a little kid, but through, through the accident, um, what are some lessons that you feel like you've learned from your mother that you have put into your practice today? Well, my mom is extremely creative. She's a musician, a singer as well. Um, and that's another thing I'm doing is uh, this is the rock and roll era. <laughs> my life. So in a, I, I mean, love it. Super talented. Yes. And we're going to play some clips because I think that your music is awesome and it's just empowering. And it's cool that your mother got that though. Um, oh, she did. And you know, she really saw me and that's what I think the, the basic foundational goodness between us is that no matter, no matter what I did, contrary to this, she always saw the best in me and she always believed in me. Whenever anything bad would happen, she'd say, you know, it's a lesson, move forward. Uh, you don't deserve this, you can do better and all of that. And then if something great happened, she would say, see, you deserve that. This is exactly who you are, never stop. Don't let yourself get treated, you know, anyway, stand for yourself. And she really believed in me even before I did. In some of this stuff, I'm like, mom, no, that's too big. And she's like, nothing's too big. You for can you. do it. Yeah. It's so, you know, yeah. it's such an, it's such an empowering thing to have that. And I, I had a mom like that too. And I just recently was, was giving a, giving a speech and, um, and she was there and it was nice to be able to kind of call out and, and thank her for that. Because I think you get to a certain age and a certain point in your career where you realize that, um, not everybody has that. And it's a real gift to be given the opportunity to find your voice, be who you are and have a cheerleader in your corner all the time. Um, so on that note, we're going to take a little bit of a break, but we'll be right back with Sadie Nardini. So stay tuned. You know, family time is about creating memories together to last a lifetime. And what better way to bond than spending time at some of the amazing attractions the Lehigh Valley has to offer? You know, you can cheer on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms or take a walk on the wild side at the Lehigh Valley Zoo. However you enjoy spending your free time, there's something here for every member of the family. For more information on things to do in the Lehigh Valley, head over to Discover Lehigh Valley's website at discoverlehighvalley.com. Picking up where we left off for being joined by Sadie Nardini. She is a total guru, a total badass, and just a strong, awesome woman. Joining us all the way from California. We're so happy that you're here. Um, let me ask you a question about your life. So you go through this tragic accident. You start to basically rehab yourself with the encouragement of your mom. Where does that will come from? Because you talked about the dark days and how you really had trouble thinking, how could this be your new life? How did you find the strength within to kind of pick yourself up and start utilizing yoga and self therapy to say you were going to overcome this, whatever that meant? Did you have a vision of what it would mean? I didn't at the time. All I thought was when I stop progressing, I'm done. So I don't, you know, I wasn't very, I wasn't enlightened about the fact that you can find peace and strength and empowerment in so many situations. I was too young and I had just started on my journey of being more conscious and aware 
and you know seeing the beauty in many many things my expectations were just completely dashed so i was just really inching along trying to find those little markers of success that many people are like oh when i make a million dollars or you know when i <laughs> when i get the, that job that i'm aiming for when i move to hawaii then i'll have made it well i thought i need to be able to control my breathing instead of letting it control me all the time and just spasm out i need to maybe get two hours of sleep at a time instead of 45 minutes that's that was my little goals and it just seems incredible but i know a lot of a lot of your listeners have gone through similar things whether it's physical or it's a, a loss of someone and you're just trying to make it minute by minute and i think that built in me the perseverance and the ability to dedicate to some of this other stuff like building all these online courses and shooting a class every morning on camera for other people, that seems like a really big deal and they have to kind of fight to get there. To me, anything after breathing properly is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. When you can break it down to your most basic need, which is breathing, all of a sudden I would imagine you get a lot of gratitude for breath. Um, but I also like the idea that you were breaking it down into very small, measurable goals. I hear people often say, and this is, a, I'm sure you hear this much more than I do. Um, well, I'm going to start going to the gym every day. Yeah. Now, whose life is that a realistic goal in? I mean, unless you're a trainer, I don't, I mean, not in, you are, and you, it's not realistic. So I always say to people, how about if we back that up and say, you're going to go to the gym twice this week and you're going to take a walk on the weekend or whatever. And not that I don't even know why I'm giving that advice, but I, yeah. <laughs> I find that it, it, I know for myself, if I want to accomplish something, I have to put a realistic goal in front of myself. And I like that you went from 45 minutes to two hours. Um, and sleep's a great one. We're also sleep deprived all the time and good sleep is hard to find. So what do you do now in your practice? And I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about that because you are the founder of Core Strength Vinyasa Yoga. Um, and you also do the yoga shred you were talking about. And I know what high intensity interval training is, HIT classes. How do you combine HIT and yoga shred and yoga flow all together. I have to understand that. Oh, so well. It's just so much fun. And you know, back to what you were saying before about not, you know, as we get older, we don't need to pummel ourselves to death anymore by doing these long workouts and we're constantly at the gym and that's our lifestyle. I want to have mimosas with my friends and go take naps <laughs> and work and have a life too. So I created the yoga shred works better in about 25 minutes or under than two to four hours of working out and it's joint safer i just created hit poses out of yoga poses so better alignment and anatomy and then i enhanced the anatomy of the more common stuff that's out there which is really hurting people often their joints and stuff so i modified but it's just a fun flow and it goes up and down the hill that's for sure you know and you're done in 20 25 minutes but you know you worked out that's what that's about. Just like trying to get people these manageable goals. Um, and like you said, I think I'm paraphrasing, but in a way to under promise and over deliver to yourself when it comes Absolutely. to your routine. Yes. Yeah, so you set it, yourself up for success instead of uh, failure. Yes. And if you hate two times a week, I'm going to do this or that thing. And then on the weekend, a walk. And Hey, if you go three times to the gym, instant victory. You know, then you can have your Pinot Grigio or whatever. It's great. <laughs> exactly. It's all about the balance. You're gonna do for, that. for people who aren't that familiar with yoga or think that yoga, I think sometimes yoga gets a little bit of a bad rep, right? Because people think that it's, it's maybe too calm or breathing. I know for me, because I'm an intense person, yoga has always been a struggle for me because it's hard for me to sort of, I feel like calm myself, but I think maybe I wasn't finding the right yoga. And ever since I've I met you and got introduced to what you do. I've looked at it in a new light. So tell me a little bit about, you know, vinyasa yoga and, and what, what role that plays in your practice and in what you're trying to do for people to empower them. Sure. Well, I'm the same way. I mean, I have, I have a very, that's why I felt like, wait, if she can do yoga, Oh my goodness, then I should be able to do yoga. <laughs> I mean, there's a million types of yoga, right? From like very restorative, just lying on the ground. One of my one of my clients came to me and she said, "I hope this isn't like the first yoga I tried because I went for a workout and I they were I just laid on the ground and I thought I just paid twenty five dollars to take a nap. I could do that at home, you know." <laughs> I mean, there are many benefits to restorative yoga, certainly, but that is not 
what I'm looking for. Nothing should be the thing that forces you to calm down. I think it should get your energy out. It should get you balanced in a way that you are ready to rest by the end of the class and you're glad for it. And then you're relaxed and you're balanced and calm. So my style of yoga is a movement style as much as a yoga style. We're moving around. We're moving our energy. We're doing fun stuff like fists of fire lunges and ha and expressing and lion yeah, the lion lioness I love that that was so much fun roar you know and you did yoga that was you doing yoga and we were all smiling and laughing our way through it and out in the shred and you're sweating too it's awesome but I think this is important especially for us go-getters this you know I'm a quadruple a type personality and if I don't check myself with a little bit of getting my energy out and then coming to balance and then at the end doing a couple of restorative things and re kind of balancing my brain hemispheres with the easy breath we do then i go off the rails and i'll burn myself out that yeah is i i wish i could tell you i didn't relate to that but unfortunately i'm i'm your reading chapter of my book <laughs> of my life so i i totally understand and i think no matter the personality type i think women tend to really um burn ourselves out. We think of others before ourselves. We do a lot of management of home and children and careers and we're caregivers, right? So a uh, lots of my friends are in like the sandwich generation where we're working, worrying about teenagers and also aging parents and also your own career. And it's a lot hitting you at the same time. And as I'm getting older, I'm finding taking that time to just to breathe. Um, I like to listen to audio tapes. I like to tapes. I'm dating myself really with that word. <laughs> Podcasts, audio, yeah. audio books on yeah. tape, on cassette in my Walkman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's important. What are, what are, what's the main feedback that you get from women that you work with? And when you do the workshops and you come to something like our women's summit here in the Lehigh Valley, what is the main Thing that you hear from women. And you were so gracious that day. I just have to say thank you to you because not only did you just get up on stage, you spent the whole day with us and every person who wanted to talk to you and every person who wanted to take a picture with you, you stayed and you did it. So I just thank you so much. It was a real gift um, on so many levels. Um, but tell me a little bit about the feedback you hear from people. Sure. Well, thanks for that, by the way. That was a wonderful day. One of my favorites. Um, and it will remain that way. And we had mimosas. So I did. <laughs> Um, and I forgot the question now. Just what is the main feedback or questions or things that you hear from women when you're out and about and you're presenting, you're speaking, you're teaching, um, that resonate with you that you want to make sure you're sharing to that wider audience? Well, I think what you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said women, especially, even if it annoys us, are born nurturers and caregivers. We're genetically programmed to do it. I swear to you. We, we tend to want to hold the community together and the way that women bond with each other, if you'll notice in language and when we talk to each other is by seeking out our similarities. So say you tell me, oh, I love your, your top. I'll say, thank you so much. Oh, I love uh, yours is so pretty. You'll say, oh, I got that in Bali. And I'll say, oh, I've been to Bali. I taught a yoga retreat there last year. And we try to find the similarities where, where the more masculine or many men, let's say, uh, tend to bond through difference. If you'll notice two, two men talking to each other for the first time, it can almost sound like they're about to get into a fight to us. And we're like, oh, don't, don't upset anybody. It's okay, you guys. But they want, they need to do that for some reason. But with women, I find they, they always come up to me and say, thank you so much for honoring that I have that ability. And that can be a dysfunction to overgive and to over overplay my energy and to drain myself for the sake of other people, to try to hold everybody together, to not cause conflict, to make sure that the community is working, but then I neglect myself. Thank you for honoring that without telling me then to just go hyper feminine and do restorative yoga all day long and bake myself cookies and stuff. You know, we need to be our fierce selves and be effective and focused out in the world but to also find that loving balance. So we're loving and fierce instead of just one or the other. And that is what I think resonates the most with women especially, but really everybody who needs to come back to that dance of that center. 
Because that's what we all want to know is that we can be both sides of the coin, right? We can be both, you know, bold and soft at the same time. Um, so I just think that's amazing. And you're so inspiring. And we're going to take a quick break, but Sadie Nardini is going to talk more with us about building a business and being a fierce and powerful businesswoman and also a musician. So stay tuned. As a mother of two, I know it can be tough to find activities that everyone will enjoy. Luckily, the Lehigh Valley has so many ways to treat your family without breaking the bank. You can experience cool discoveries at the Da Vinci Science Center or all aboard the WKNS railroad train for an afternoon adventure. There's fun around every corner of the Lehigh Valley, and you can uncover it all on Discover Lehigh Valley's website. Visit discoverlehighvalley.com for more information. Sadie Nardini, we're so excited you're here with us, Santa Barbara, California, lucky duck. Um, I mean, we love the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, but who doesn't love Santa Barbara, the most beautiful place in the world, arguably, certainly in the United States. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us here. Uh, we've been so happy to be learning about your journey, your amazing um, childhood struggles to uh, restore your own health and learn the practice of yoga and then building your business uh, and the lessons that you've been learning along the way. I'd love to talk to you now a little bit about being a businesswoman because we focused a lot on what you do in your business. Uh, and your yoga practice and your mentoring, and your leadership. But talk to me a little bit about the actual business itself, because as another female business owner, um, it has its own set of challenges and excitements. Um, how did you go from learning and instructing yoga to building this Sadie Nardini empire, let's call it? Well, <laughs> good question. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, long journey as short as I can make it, I did start out burning myself out by teaching like 20 times a week in New York City, one of the most competitive, fast paced places in the world for not not just yoga, but let's yoga too. I ended up owning a yoga studio there in Soho. It was 12 grand a month Oof. for rent for starters. And we kept that pace up from the first month. It was quite amazing. People love that yoga. But then I realized I was really um, hamstringing myself and not allowing myself to travel and get bigger and do more of the things that were coming my way and the opportunities. So I left that studio to a partner and I started traveling the world. And I was like, yeah, I'm free. I have I have a different schedule. I can go to this conference and, and that summit and this. And then that started burning me out because I was doing it every weekend. Getting on no a free time, just up, up, in and out, up and down. Right. And I thought, you know what I'd really like now is to stay at home more and really, truly be able to set my own schedule, but have some projects that are building because of the work I do. Online stuff is going through the roof right now. We all know that. I found a way to make these courses like 21 day beginner yoga or fit and fierce over 40 or, you know, rock your social media for, for professionals all that stuff, I could make those at home in my own time, put them out, couple partners, and then myself too. And this is going really gangbusters This at this point. We made, I think last year, it was about $675,000, almost $700,000 through the business. So I am the CEO of Sadie Nardini LLC, which I love because that's it's me. It's what I want to do when I want to do it. But I really had to learn how to run a virtual business. It's not exactly like a brick and mortar business. You've got to kind of self-direct a lot more. You don't have that overhead, but you have to pay people who know what they're doing because I don't when it comes to technical stuff. However, it's been one of the most lucrative and fascinating and, and freeing experiences for me. So that's where we're at right now and growing. So Tell me a little bit about your team because you are, you know, you're able to be flexible and work from home and, and do that. But you, but it does like you referenced, you know, you've been smart to bring in experts and surround yourself with people who strengthen your skill set. Talk to me a little bit about that and how important it is to have the right team in place. It's crucial. Delegation is key, especially, you know, for happiness and success. That's that you could do it all yourself, but should you? And I, I knew early on, look, I, I want to get to be this. I want to get to do what only I can do and delegate to other people to do what they can do best. And if somebody makes a mistake here and there, it's way better than me spending 40 hours a week on it. Just so maybe everything and I'll still make mistakes. So who cares anyway? 
but they're here here's my current main team i have a tech guy who does all of the uploading all the tech stuff creates and designs my website my online club uh, any course I want to make or training, he sets all that stuff up. And then he has another guy. So they tag team the tech. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> two, two guys <laughs> to run this empire. But if one doesn't know something, the other one will. And it's really great. Then I have a woman who is my content manager, helps me schedule myself for the two months out structure. And like you say, like back it up and structure the bite sized things I'm going to need to do each week to meet my goals for the business, helps me write stuff, sometimes sends out my newsletter and all that good stuff. I have a millennial who knows how to use Instagram way better than I do. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Yes. You were dealing with our, our podcast producer, Dakota, who also does a lot of our social media and it's yeah. just amazing. If they don't know, they can figure it out so fast. <laughs> yeah. She's making me ads. I've never even seen ads this cool out of videos that I make at my house. And it's just lovely. She does my stories on Instagram and she'll, I'll send her the photos and the text. So I like to write everything still. I like to write all the stuff on my social media. It's still all me, but I have someone else putting it kind together. Implementing and yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. And then creating all the zhuzhi like, Ooh, click swipe up and click over here and all that. <laughs> Now I learned how to do some of it. So I would know how to do it if I had to, but I don't have to do it. And that is the beautiful part about it. My last really big team member is James, my husband. And I have been blessed to marry a guy who's not only awesome, but who is a photographer, videographer, way better than anything I used to do because I used to do it all myself. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't have this team. You got to start somewhere. And I did not start with a team, honey. So you, yeah, if I you did it all. And then as you grew, yeah, you learned, yeah. I, I learned a term called cover your blind spots. And I just feel like that's always been a good one. Cause when you're starting out and you're building any kind of business, you really do have to just do all the pieces that need to be done, right? You just have to get it done. Yeah. But as you grow, the only way to keep growing is to delegate and outsource and ask for help. And we got to meet your amazing husband and so talented, all the stuff he puts together. How is that working together? I mean, is it something where you are actually together a lot or is it something where you kind of have different schedules and you overlap sometimes? How does that work, a marriage and a business marriage? <laughs> Well, you know, it works, as they say, as well as we work it. And some weeks we have a project due, like this week. We are filming. We get up. We get ready. We film. We're like machines. We're filming for an hour or two. I edit the stuff while he gets ready. Then it's up to us whether we want to go somewhere together or if we feel we need some separate time. Yesterday I had some separate time and I went and did my own thing and, you know, but today I feel like seeing him. So after this podcast, <laughs> we're going out to the beach bar and having some lunch and a drink. Um, but it works fine because we're both well-matched and we don't mind being around each other a lot. That is unusual for me, <laughs> uh, but I found the right guy. And yeah, he, that's a, that's a soulmate when you feel that way, I think. It really is. And you know, I have to say he's, he helps me improve in every way. And there are some days I want to phone it in like, Oh, I, it's good enough. Let's just, let's just do it. He's like, no, we need to put the microphone on. We need to light it well. And you, you now can't go down in quality. You've got to either maintain where you are or improve upon that. So he's really good at quality control. I'm really good at just wanting to get it over with, you know, <laughs> to the next thing. Vision. I will call that vision. We'll call it that. Yes. For but, people. you know, I, I counterbalance myself with people who have different views, who have different energies and who tend to hold me back and contain me just enough. But I also move them forward and help expand them just enough. So it's a it's a nice kind that of is very much my relationship with my husband. And and uh, and I think it's a good thing. I think that you kind of help balance each other and push when you need to, but hold back when you need to as well. And if you can find that rhythm, um, it could be a very happy place when it's out of rhythm. Maybe it's a little more of a challenge. Not so much. Sometimes <laughs> I'm so just much. like, I need my own space. You know? <laughs> and then I know it's gone a bit too far, but he is very supportive of that. And it's up to me to ask. And that's really a new skill I'm building is to say, Oh, I'm giving out now so much and, and creating, which I love, but I've got to check in with myself daily now and say, what do you really need? Not just in two weeks when you've had enough and you desperately need this or that, but each day so that I can pour back in while I'm pouring out. 
at the same time instead of pouring out noticing one is low and then starting to like backpedal and you know never usually has the best reaction either if it gets to that point right. no yeah so, you know we don't suddenly scream at our spouses about leaving the toothpaste cap off or something when we really just <laughs> self time I love that. Well, I don't, I, you know, your husband makes, when you brought him up, now I'm thinking about your music career and I don't want to let you go without talking about that a little bit. And I think that you mentioned being creative. You mentioned your mother being super creative and musical and tell me a little bit about Sadie and the tribe. You have this great band. We got to listen to some of your music. Your husband is, is your music producer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so tell me about how this came about. Have you always played music? Are you self-taught? Did you learn as a kid? Well, I learned a uh, really crappy piano playing as a kid. I mm. took a ton of lessons, but I just didn't really take to it. I was always singing though, and that's probably because my mom was a, and is a singer. I remember her on a piano in this great white spandex outfit, kind of rocking out with her band all along the Midwest and just really thinking, wow, how awesome is that? going to rehearsals and all that. And then I would start singing. I had a couple bands in high school, but as the yoga career took off and I felt like I was really sharing my voice,